Welcome back to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast, and this is our fourth episode, and this is our fourth week in uh, our Romans series. This week, Cole is talking to Pastor Dennis McFadden about the concept of peace and hope. Uh, Dennis has a uh, many years background in counseling. He's a marriage and family therapist, so he's got a very interesting perspective and a lot of wisdom to give um, on this topic and and the topic of anxiety that kind of goes hand in hand with this. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Cole and Pastor Dennis. So welcome, Dennis. Thank you for for joining me for our, our, gosh, is this the fourth podcast we've we've jumped into? So uh, I'm excited to just talk to you about, you know, some of the stuff that you were uh, teaching in your sermon, but, uh, you know, also just kind of see where this goes. I'd love to have a conversation with you because I know your background and, and uh, while I know your background, maybe some others don't. So if you could just kind of tell us a little bit, a bit about yourself and, and uh, what, what you like to do, hobbies, what your, your background. In, in your work is and, and what you do here at Shoreline. Sure, love to. Yeah. Uh, I will have been a pastor here for 20 years in January. Holy cow. I started teaching at the church before that mm-hmm. when I was a private practice marriage family therapist. Okay. I've been a counselor for just about 40 years. Wow. wow. Uh, something's working. I don't know what, but here I am doing <laughs> yeah. it. Um, so uh, I came to the church. Uh, Basically, as someone checking it out, having moved to Monterey, Mm -hmm. but coming here long before that to fish and dive. I'm an ocean nut. Met Pastor Howie, the founder, and Pastor Johnny, and after about six months, they said, hey, could you help us with counseling here? And I said, okay, let me pray about it, and I did. And they um, said, maybe in three or four months, could you do that if it works? I said, okay, and then I I accepted it, Mm -hmm. and I had a practice in the Bay Area that I would commute to and a small one here. And I said, okay, Pastor Howie, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Then he said, when do you want to have the commissioning? And again, I really honestly, in my mind, saw someone swinging a bottle of champagne <laughs> across the bow of a new boat. I really did. I'd never heard of commissioning. Yeah. I'd worked with pastors for years in the Bay Area. Yeah. And I finally said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, we're going to make you pastor. I was like stunned because I'd worked with churches, yeah, yeah. Yeah. pastors for years and realized I never wanted to work for a church. <laughs> And certainly didn't want to be a pastor. Yeah. So, so he said, well, you got to think about it. Prayed for about two weeks, came back and said, yeah, I think it's right to do. So I was commissioned along with Pastor Tom Green at the same time, first wow. two ever. And then I learned he'd checked me out. He called people in, yeah, in the Bay Area yeah. and did a little background vetting and all that. Yeah. And so I became the thing I thought I'd never be. And I've loved it every day since. As for a therapist. Yeah. I worked in county mental health starting about 40 years ago uh, in a motherload county in California. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, worked in a alcoholism center for uh, Native Americans in Flagstaff, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And that's where I learned that I love trauma and emergency crisis and all wow. that crazy stuff. You love it, huh? <laughs> right. And then when I worked at the county in mental health, I also did shifts in our psych unit, our yeah. lockdown psych unit and outpatient. Loved it. So went on to get my marriage family therapist license, which wow. I hold to this yeah. day. And I do a little private work on the side, not yeah. with people that would come through Shoreline. Right, right. There's an ethical wall there. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned hobbies. Yeah. It's all about the ocean. All about the ocean. And that's, this is the place. This is the place. Yeah, where it I, is. Yeah. That's part of the reason I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a triathlon, which I've been doing for about 16, well, 20 years, actually, wow. through Terry and Betsy Davis. Thank yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And then the ocean is about spear fishing. Yeah. I got a boat. It's fishing, spear fishing. It's harvest in the sea. Yeah. Everywhere my wife and I travel, bless her heart, we're usually <laughs> close to water that I can get in. Now, is that something that she was like into before or no, is you indoctrinated? No, absolutely not. That's what love looks like, <laughs> yeah. brother. Right yeah, there. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, that's funny. Yeah. Those are my hobbies. Those I'm always checking the ocean conditions, driving down yeah. by it, diving in it, yeah. harvesting fresh fish. I love it. Yeah. Fish tacos. When people say, where's the best fish tacos in the county? I'll say, well, humbly, my house. <laughs> <laughs> humbly. You add that, you say that. Uh, well, yeah. It depends on the audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting background you have in, in counseling and uh, the emergency stuff you're talking about. I, 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 I hear that. And then I hear your sermon and I'm like, man, uh, 
you have an interesting perspective on this idea of hope and peace and, and, and the kind of hope and peace that we can have in Christ. But man, I, I can't imagine, uh, the experiences that you've had through like counseling with, with, uh, families and individuals and stuff. Is that, has that given you a different perspective on, on your faith or is that, is that something that you've kind of known through throughout your life or it, it really has given me a different perspective. I was saved going up on the stage at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa with Chuck Smith mm-hmm. and Lonnie Frisbee at 18. I was not raised with any Christian influence of any yeah. kind. And I felt different from that moment forward. Now, I wandered away at times over the years, mm-hmm. but it made a huge difference. The way I was raised, my brother and I were raised, um, we had every reason to be anxious and depressed yeah. 24 <laughs> hours a day. And at times were. Yeah. But the Lord coming into my heart changed everything. Wow. And it does to this day. Yeah. So when I counsel, I always let people know, just just by the way, I'm a Christian. Even in my private office, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And you need to know that about me. And I believe that God is real and he does intervene and do more than we can do. Mm-hmm. So I'm just letting you know ahead of time. Yeah. That's what we're going to do when we meet and talk. Now, if you're not comfortable with it, I understand that. But you need to know I will never depart from it. Yeah. So it has changed everything and how I view anxiety, yeah. how I view worries, all of that. It's helped tremendously. Yeah. Is that so um, we've been talking a little bit uh, prior to, to recording, but is there is, you know, I've always kind of been aware of anxiety and in, uh, in a way that it's like uh, a situational anxiety or a um, uh, what would you say? Um, uh, like a diagnosed or uh, yeah. type of anxiety. Is there is there a different way to approach those kind of things when you're talking about, um, I guess, uh, in practical terms of like trying to um, help subside anxieties, sure. but also with your faith? Is there a different like uh, there reality is. to there, those? And it's important to know. It's a good question. It's important to know the differences. Yeah. Uh, simply put, really, to understand it best, there's what we call an exogenous mm-hmm. Uh, stimulus, meaning something outside of me happened, yeah, and a reasonable response to it would be one of worry, yeah. great concern, maybe even anxiety. Yeah. Then there's something we would call endogenous. It's just part of me. It's yeah, within. Internal. Yeah. And there are folks who have personalities wired to worry. Right. Right. They're anxious about many things, most things, mm-hmm. and they can temporarily achieve peace yeah. in life if either randomly for no reason mm-hmm. or when problems subside, there's no new problems yeah. and blessings come. They're they're sort of temporarily at rest, but they're ready for the anxiety to spike should either randomly again spike or other events happen. Yeah. They're wired to worry. I, I One of my own family members is that way. Yeah, yeah. So you would, if I'm a counselor, I'm going to look at them very differently. Right. If someone has a worry such as unexpectedly, I was laid off at work. Mm-hmm. Most people were. I'm worried about the future. Yeah. They came in and talked to me about it. I wouldn't tell them right away, stop worrying. Yeah. That's a life concern. It's normal to be concerned and to worry and all of that. But if they got a new job and things were good and they came in a year later and said, I don't know why it is. I just still worry at that level. I would say, okay, this is different. Yeah. That's beyond reasonable timeline, okay, yeah, yeah. reasonable yeah. resolution. Mm-hmm. So we have to look at maybe there's something deeper going on in yeah. you. So when people have worry, excessive worry mm-hmm. and anxiety from early on in their life, that means it's part of the hardwiring. Right. That's a whole different tack you would take to help someone with that. Right. Right. So is there, you know, I know just knowing you personally, uh, I know that you've kind of uh, develop some steps and, and things for, for different things like hard conversations with, with people or, or, or navigating difficult, um, you know, times with family members or different things like that. Are there, are there some kind of like practical things, uh, maybe, uh, a process or a step by step something. I know it seems like a pretty, uh, lofty, you know, uh, idea that there's like these like simple things, but are there like some, you know, simple practical things that someone could take and say, you know, uh, navigating is this uh, say those those different types of anxiety endogenous again. yeah inside of me yeah exogenous is X for external outside yeah. Of me. yeah so is there is there a way for people to kind of navigate and figure out within themselves like am I dealing with a, a you know an external thing or an internal thing sure and then h- how do I like work towards 
Well, say, that. say you're in a relationship or you have several good friendships. Right. There's two steps. One, you look at yourself. Yeah. Honestly, take that search within. Then ask people close to you after that. Yeah. How do you yeah. see me? Yeah. Part of that is, here's another site concept. We have a thing called the Jahari window. Okay. Think of a square Yeah. and there's four quadrants. Okay. And this is about perception, mm -hmm. how I perceive me and how others perceive me. And this has been uh, uh, replicated in research over and over again. Here's the four quadrants. In one quadrant is the things I know about myself that nobody else can know. Yeah. Another quadrant is the things the person closest to me know about me that I don't know. Right. A third quadrant is things we both know about me. And a fourth is things neither one of us know about me. And this is pretty much true. It's yeah. not always 25% for each quadrant. Yeah, yeah. But it's true. So when you know that, and I believe this is true. Yeah. I mean, after all, with my wife, she's watching me and listening to me. I'm not watching me right. and listening to me, so I'm not picking up all the cues I send out. Right. That's the person I would check with and say, I'm thinking I feel this or this is going on, but yeah. what, what are, are you, you seeing? Yeah. yeah. So that's the two-step process. I look within, ask a trusted person close to me and say, what do you see? Yeah. And if I'm in a treatment model right or, or a journey i would say would you write down what you see mm -hmm. i need to keep that with me i have to really embrace this and internalize it as this is the truth about me and anxiety and how it how it feels to me and how it looks to you right right i yeah. need to know both yeah that's that's powerful i think uh you know that that to me seems like a very um you know, a broad way to look at like how to navigate and, and it really helps you kind of pinpoint some things in, in my mind. I'm, I'm seeing how that can greatly benefit me even. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Well, I'll tell you a little yeah. bit more about it if you want. Yeah. Uh, two things. First of all, as a Christian a follower of Jesus, I believe that he's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or dream. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting from Ephesians, paraphrasing. Yeah. I believe that's real. So that takes me to a life verse that I have. And most of my life verses I've accidentally memorized, as I say, <laughs> periodically, because I focused on them so much. Yeah, yeah. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says to his apostles right after the Last Supper, he's getting them ready for his departure. Mm -hmm. He says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. And here comes the key, the key statement he makes. I do not give as the world gives. Mm. So let not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I, I seize on that one sentence. I do not give as the world gives. And I, I hear what he's saying. I look in the context and who he's talking to. Right. He knows their fate. He knows mm -hmm. their journey. Mm -hmm. He knows they are going to suffer. Yeah. If the only peace they can get is what they grew up trusting was, yeah. well, the peace you get from things being okay, <laughs> my problem solved. Yeah. He knows they're doomed internally. Yeah. They're doomed. So are we. Yeah. As a believer, if the only piece I think I have access to is when I'm able through control and then through serendipity, <laughs> I don't have problems right now. Everything's working. Yeah. As I love to say, and people probably heard me say it a number of times, that isn't what I call peace. That's mm. what I call respite. It's a break. Yeah. <laughs> it's a break yeah. in the action. It's, like, it's an eye. Like a day with the storm. ocean that it's flat. Yeah. Sea. Don't be thinking that's how it stays. So you're moving here yeah. to have a flat ocean. Yeah. So he says, my peace is deeper. And I really believe that the peace he talked about had a huge uh, effect on them staying the course till their martyrdom. Wow. Yeah. So I teach that and I believe yeah. that for believers. Yeah. That's one thing. But what's a practical way somebody can handle something simple? For example, yeah. how many students in school have test anxiety? Millions. Yeah. I was diagnosed with it, not officially, yeah. in college. When my Spanish professor said to me, Senor McFadden, it seems in class you are very bright, but you do so poorly on the exam. <laughs> I think you have test anxiety. And I can I remember the what she looked like on that yeah. day. It froze in my mind. So when I went away to college to a four year school in Arizona, I, my grades at first where I was struggling, I thought, I gotta get a hold of this anxiety. Yeah. So what does test anxiety do? When you're anxious about an exam and everyone's a little concerned, yeah. a little worried, but you get to a certain level and you're actually anxious, mm -hmm. we know then it starts to block retrieval of data that you do have. Hmm. You can't get at it. It won't come out. 
And the more anxious you get about, I can't remember, I can't right, remember, right. the yeah. worse it gets. Yeah. So I realized I got to do something about my test anxiety. I didn't have any guidance at all. Yeah. So I developed a little thing I did, and I've taught it forever. I would sit up. <laughs> oddly enough, I was in a class when I discovered this called abnormal psychology, <laughs> which, as you might guess, I loved yeah. <laughs> being abnormal yeah. psychologically. I would sit outside the door on test day in the hallway. Yeah. I would not go in till the teacher came in. I was reading Sports Illustrated about college football. Yeah. Because the key is get your mind off the worry track yeah. by having your mind go somewhere unrelated. And it has to be something you're interested in. Well, I love college football. Yeah. I had a friend who played for Arizona State. So I had this article and I'd read the article and guarantee my brain isn't thinking about the test. Right. I hear him whisk by, I see him, I go in and I sit at the desk. Then I close my eyes and I would go to Clear Creek in northern Arizona and go trout fishing while he was talking. <laughs> then, you know, saying what the test yeah, was totally. about. Yeah, totally. Then he'd say, correction on one. I'd say, okay, come out of the creek for a sec. One. <laughs> number 12, number 18. Okay. Then I go back down to the creek. And the key was, it was a process. All right, yeah. I'm going to fish for a trout. Get the pole. You got to put this lure on. I could either engage in that process or not. If I did, right. your brain can't go to the worry track. Mm hmm then I'd never start the test till he said, okay, begin. I never, after I made corrections, I turned it over so I wouldn't even accidentally look at it. Yeah. Because I knew on that first page, if I saw one question I didn't know the answer to, my anxiety would take off. Yeah. I wasn't going to let it happen. Then I flipped the test over and when he said begin, I would race through it answering every question I instantly knew, leaving a third of the test unanswered. But I trusted something I'd learned. Yeah. By the time you have this race through the test to the end, some of the answers you knew opened doors to other answers. Right. So I go back through the test a second time, and by golly, I knew about six more <laughs> answers. Trusted it again. I always yeah. did it three times. By the third time through the test, a couple more would pop up, and then I was done. I knew I was done. Done. I finished the test before everybody, and my grades soared. Wow. By managing the anxiety and not letting it block. Yeah. I was able to retrieve the data that I believed was in there because I studied like crazy, and it changed my whole college career. So is then is the I'm I'm just wondering if like the the anxieties those those thoughts those worries are are distracting you from uh, 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 accessing the data that you have. Yes. The the how is the thinking about trout fishing on a, on a river not doing the same thing? It's because I'm not anxious of... about trout fishing. Okay. I love it. So it's the nature of the distraction. The topic, it's called thought distraction. Okay. When, you, when you decide, I got to distract my thoughts. Yeah. It can't, you can't select something to go to that you're not interested in. Right. You can't select something to go to that makes you worry more. Mm -hmm. You got to select something that you really enjoy. Enjoy, yeah. And it captures you and there's steps to it. Hmm. So you have like three or four, like I, I, I treated a guy once years ago. He loved rebuilding uh, Yamaha engines on dirt bikes. Wow. I said, all right, for you, start from the beginning. Let's go yeah. to the engine. Yeah. And he would do it. Wow. It's a little bit like this call. For people who have trouble going to sleep, yeah. I told them right, right away, the worst thing you can do is sit on the edge of the bed and say, oh, God, help me go to sleep. Yeah. Help me go to sleep. <laughs> then lay down and say, Lord, help me sleep. Help me sleep. Yeah. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray. But when you pray for that exact thing, what does it remind you of? Yeah. Every second that you're still not asleep, which yeah. troubles and you. And that you're incapable of doing it. I'm yeah. not sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. So I tell people, don't pray that. Well, isn't it good to pray? Yeah. Pray for some mission trip to build boats for people in the Caribbean and yeah. what you would do to get it started that doesn't provoke any anxiety or yeah. any worry at all. So thought distraction is something we can do. Wow. And here's a reality yeah. about what we call perseveration or rumination. You get on a thought train, you can't get out of it. Right, right. In most cases, if it's day after day or night after night, you have a particular topic you get on the wheel about, mm -hmm. you will not think any original thoughts after about 10 minutes. Wow. Because you think at the rate of 12 yeah. to 1,500 words a minute. That's interesting. For 10 minutes, there yeah. won't be anything new. But your mind now is trained to stay on it yeah. with, the, with the thinking falsely. If I just keep doing this forever, there'll be a bing. Yeah, yeah. And there isn't, and there won't be. Yeah, yeah. Coming up with that like resolution on your own, and yeah, it's I, I see that even just in day to day, you know, activities or like working at my desk or you know where I'm, 
you're you're struggling so hard to find that thing that's on the tip of your tongue kind of thing, you know. Take a break. That's, yeah. <laughs> Do something that's, that's unrelated. No, totally. You may come back and yeah. go. You know, one of the reasons when people wake up in the morning, they might say, they haven't even entered their day. They might say, you know, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember the names of my second cousin's kids in Missouri. And they're all, they're all coming to me right now. Yeah. Why? You woke up, you're rested, you're relaxed, you can retrieve the data. Yeah. The night before, you couldn't for the life of you yeah. remember three of those seven names. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I've had so many of those conversations where I'm, I'm, I got this, this, uh, you know, product, and the name of the product is like on the tip of my tongue, and we're, we're all like trying to figure <laughs> it out. And we can't do it, and then like we, I just, I give up. Oh, I relent, you know. And then like we're, we've moved on to another conversation, and then. You know, it's half an hour. I just blurt it out, and it's like, wait, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's so funny. I that's such an interesting thing. I I uh, I guess I understand like the mechanics of it, but it's it's an interesting thing to try to put in practice. I well, yeah. another biblical principle that's really important is the words of Jesus in Matthew six. Mm -hmm. He essentially is telling everyone, look, we're going to meet your basic needs. Um, <clears throat> and. <clears throat> Excuse me, he admonishes and rebukes a bit. Right. He said, Why are you worried about tomorrow? Does not tomorrow have enough trouble? Not, does not today yeah. have enough troubles of its own? Yeah. Can you add one cubit to your life by worrying about tomorrow? Every modern psychotherapist today will use that exact same principle. Yeah. Stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. Yeah, stay in absolutely. the moment. Because we don't know the future. But if you're anxiously worried about the future, you almost always project a negative future. Yeah. And in reality, as we go through times of our life, seasons of difficulty, we look back and say, you know what? Out of those 15 times I was really wrapped up in anxiety, only once did the thing I worry about happen. Yeah. Every, everything else worked out. So Jesus himself and every major world religion yeah. says, stay in the moment, stay in the yeah. moment. Well, thought distraction is a great way to stay in the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I also don't hear you really saying that like, preparation for the future or thinking about like what's you know how, how that's not a bad thing planning isn't it's, a bad yeah thing. yeah it's unless you plan for a disaster all the all time, time. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah which, that could be troublesome well and so okay so it is so easy to do that yes. right now yes like with everything that's happening it's just it, it it feels constant it feels constant so i i have a question for you to just um you know in your message from the Sunday, um, you talk about peace and hope. And and I just wanted to ask you that what are some things uh, that people can be doing uh, in a year like this? In a year like this, what are some things that people can can do that they can hold on to, some, um, uh, some practical things they can do to hold on to those concepts of yeah. peace and hope? Because uh, I, I think that we're all just really you see everything that's going on. It's so easy to do that, yeah. like preparation for disaster at all times mm -hmm. and like what's to come with anything, you know, or lamenting uh, the way yeah, things are going. Yeah. Can only yeah. end badly. Yeah. And you, you also talk about like, how do we, how do we find those benefits in suffering? You know, yeah. like, yeah. Oh man, what a hard thing to try to navigate as an individual yeah. or as like uh, a household and, and trying to navigate that with your spouse or your kids or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that something that, is there something that you can, you know, fill us in on? Give us the secret, Dennis, to figuring this, I got a this secret. out. <laughs> okay. No one's ever thought of this <laughs> yeah. before or heard I'm of sure. it before. Everyone listen Except up. Except from the ancient Greeks. Today. <laughs> so speaking of what we're going through now, we touched on it yeah. uh, Sunday in the message. There's more that's accumulating than people really know. For example, right. I was watching a football game the other day, mm -hmm. knowing, because I read an article about it, yeah. the broadcasters are in the booth broadcasting, but many aren't. For example, regional games or local games, right, right. like the 49er game, Greg Papa's at home in his home studio. He's not at the stadium. They don't travel anymore. The local guys do not travel to the away games anymore. Wow, that's interesting. They're connected on their home, in their home studios or at a studio down the street or something. So we might think, oh, that's too bad. But what about the guys in the national games uh, that are in the booth? Mm -hmm. Well, there they are. The camera shows them. There's no people in the stands, right. but they're in the booth. But if you talk to anybody who's in broadcasting, what you learn is calling the game is a small part of the whole thing. Oh, yeah. 
getting yeah. there a few days early, seeing all your friends, hanging out, these great dinners, yeah. all the joviality, the collegial attitude, the locker room yeah. stuff, going into a locker room, talking to players who yeah. you've known for years, they know you, all of it's gone. Yeah. Feeding off the crowd. Feeding off the that, crowd that, is gone. The energy is, yeah. So it, it happens, uh, uh, it's happening on all kinds of fronts. The, right. the things we've taken for granted are missing. Yeah. So for example, I have a family member young man of my extended family who's very productive, highly f- functioning, hmm. does very well, very successful, has his own job and then has three separate businesses he started with wow. LLCs, thriving in business. But it came to me that he's not doing well. Hmm. Person, I love yeah. this guy. I've known him forever. Yeah. So I called him up and we just got in a conversation. In the end, he just started sharing and I shared. I said, hey, this thing's hard on me or some things I miss. You know, I, I've gone to the Monterey Sports Center for 15 years, three to five mornings a week. Right. I can't go. I know a lot of people there. They know me. They weren't my best friends. I'm not their best friend, but we're friends. Yeah. We can't see, see each other. So I was talking to him and I just, here's the key. I just opened the door for him to ask a few questions, you know, what's going on? And he told me, and he was saying, so it, this is killing me. He's an extrovert. It's killing me. Yeah. I need to be with people. I can't just say, oh, well, it's not like that for right. me. It's killing me. And I took it to heart. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he goes, you know what? It was just good to talk about it. So one of the keys is, I checked in with him again last week, and one of the keys is, if you got kids at home, somebody in your life, open the doors intentionally to talk about it. Right. To make it okay to talk about what's happening to you. Yeah. What isn't working for you. If you're feeling depressed, bring it out. If you're feeling anxious and either one is unusual for you, or, or this person, the people wouldn't know it about you, mm-hmm. or you're pretty clear it's related to all the stress, give in and admit it. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of high functioning people who, to their last breath, don't want to admit something is affecting them. Right. Right. You've got to be able to talk. About How, it. So, and I, I totally, I feel that. I, I definitely, I see where like a, a mature adult can, can, say, okay, I need to admit to myself, I'm struggling with something. I'm struggling with, you know, I, I find myself as, as kind of like an in-betweener on the introvert extrovert. And I, I, I definitely love, you know, communicating, talking with people, but I do also like my alone time. So sure. I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I can kind of relate to like those extroverts that like kind of need those interactions and stuff. And, uh, I definitely see that, that, uh, I think it takes a humility uh, to, to come out and admit that. But, uh, I can see mature adults doing that, but how do, how do parents, how do grandparents navigate that reality, that necessity with kids who don't really know, uh, how to go about making that clear, especially with like the education system being what it is right now and being isolated from friends, from family, from, you know, what does that look like for parents? How's that? Yeah. Well, there's a there's a concept in psychoanalysis that call it's yeah. called twinning, twins. Hmm. What it means is sharing the experience of the person you're you're right. dealing with. So I call it alongside of with kids. Yeah. So if a parent wants to open the door for their child to talk to them about what they're feeling, yeah. Probably the least successful way is to say, all right, let's sit down, and when I start us, you're gonna feel free and begin talking about how you're feeling. Yeah. Most kids, that's going to be really a challenge. Yeah. And as children grow older, Mm -hmm. young men are even less likely to do it. Yeah, right. So the way I advocate people do it, and I learned the hard way with my four kids, (laughs) was you come alongside of and talk about what you're going through. Hmm. Man, this time is really hard for me. I I was just thinking the other day, I don't like not being with people. I wake up at night sometimes, and I get a little worried, and other days I'm kind of down, but I don't know about you. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if you went through some of that, but I know I am. Yeah. That's the most likely way to get a kid to feel like, well, gosh, if this that's big normal person that I admire yeah. and respect yeah. feels this way, it does what we call it normalizes it for right. the child. It, it's unique for a child to be able to just step up, depending on age and maturity, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. volunteer it. Well, why? Because that's an admission. I'm not functioning well. I'm not doing well. And right. these giant people that I admire respect, they're not doing it. So apparently it's not good yeah. to have this go on. Maybe it's not even safe to talk about. So the parent takes the initiative yeah. and just says, I, 
I'm struggling today. I don't know about you, buddy, but I am. I mean, I'm okay, but I am struggling. Yeah. That lays a groundwork for the child, even if they don't say anything then. The idea that there's something wrong with them now slowly can dissolve. Yeah. They're just feeling like big people. Do. Right, right. And that sets the stage for them to maybe talk or yeah. throw a few concepts out there or let you know in some way they're ready to talk more right. about it. So that seems just like right at face value, it seems very effective. Like I can, I can imagine that working well. So then what do you do? Like, do you have resources or anything? Like, what do you do? And then your child or your grandchild or someone is, is now being vulnerable and feeling comfortable with that. Like then what do you, how do you navigate the rest of that? Well, that's a great question. Um, and the answer's changed over time. Yeah. 30 years ago, I would have said, all right, let me show you four books I have on my shelf here. Right. Because they would be books you didn't know about, didn't have access to, never yeah. heard of. Only a trained therapist has. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. That's all changed. Yeah, totally. So I tell people now, just do some investigating of your environment. Right. Ask yourself some questions about what's the most important thing here with my child or my mm -hmm. mate or friends or whatever. And is it uh, a reasonable worry, a reasonable anxiety? Right. And what do I... Do we have other factors going on that are mm -hmm. even more troubling mm -hmm. beyond COVID, beyond worries about smoke in the air? Yeah. Do a little bit of detective work on your own and then go on the internet. Yeah. There, I said it. Go on the internet. You're not old school anymore. Old schools, not the new cool <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the internet. Yeah. I've had to be whipped into shape here, yeah. I got to tell you. But... So the average person can, then what you can do is ask a more specific question. Right. For example, if you said books on helping kids with anxiety, oh, you're going to get thousands of titles. Yeah. Yeah. But if you make your question more specific, you'll get a narrow, narrower list. Yeah. And then when you click on one, see what they reference. Yeah. And you'll get, you'll get it winnowed or narrowed down more to your specific and unique circumstances. Right. Yeah. That's helpful. I think... Man, I think for a lot of parents and grandparents too, I, I, it's hard to navigate. You know what's reliable, what's yeah. what's yeah. what's worth my time because this seems to be an immediate need. You know what's worth my time, like investigating and and, and reading through. So that's that's. Well, very let helpful. me give you another caution about yeah books and materials. Yeah, the reason there's so many new titles coming out in a topic area every day. Mm -hmm. Is because nobody's nailed it. Yeah, that's fair. By nailed it, I mean <laughs> wrote the one book that yeah. everybody can use and it just fixes Cures it. Cures it all. However, yeah. most book titles have to claim that they've nailed right, it. Right, right. Or you're not going to buy the book. Mm -hmm. So be careful. When you buy a book, believe that, you know, a percentage of this will be helpful to me. Yeah. But be careful you don't fall into the trap of this book's sad. Yeah. And it's going to fix everything. And why hasn't it? Why doesn't yeah. it? And when you read the books, the model's pretty much the same. Statement of the problem, the problem in narrative style of certain people and what they were suffering with, right, right, right. concepts and theories to help, success stories at the end, final, you can do it too. All, yeah. all the books follow something like that. Right, right. But be careful. Yeah. If you find a book that seems good and it doesn't work for you, it's not you probably. Yeah. There's other materials that might be helpful. I don't think I buy a single book on psychotherapy or counseling or anything and read the whole book through mm -hmm. anymore. I look for the chunks that apply where I am and what right, I'm right. doing are useful. I encourage our listeners today and yeah. our viewers to follow the same model. Find one that has some useful stuff and yeah. go with that. Expectations need to yes. be set. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Hey, so kind of bringing it a little bit back to um, uh, kind of your sermon and, and where we've been going in, in uh, Romans uh, as a church. Um, you know, Pastor Kevin has, um, uh, he's been really using this imagery of uh, a, a road trip or a road map. Or, uh, I, I'm just uh, curious uh, to ask you, it seems a little um, uh, sudden to go from talking about sin and, and kind of some of the depravities of man and, and then to jump into like hope and peace in Christ, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, so I'm, I guessing I'm, I'm asking, you know, what is it that causes us to, to, it's telling us to on this road trip, the next step, the next logical step is to go from talking about sin and, and, and pain in the world into like, we can have hope in, in Christ. So what's that, that process look like? Yeah. Well, um, Pastor Kevin uh, preached 
right doctrine straight from scripture. And yeah. sometimes it's hard to hear mm-hmm. or sinners yeah. period. Don't deny it. Don't run from it. Admit it. Yeah. Okay. I do. Yeah. But how do we get from that to grace? How do we get to that from that to hope? Mm-hmm. That's what I understand your question. To yeah. Be. Yeah. So I really like the words of Peter in the first chapter of second Peter. When I have it right here, can I read it to you? Absolutely. I'd, I really yeah. love it. Yeah. Uh, well, when I say I have it right here, it means I'm on my way to having yeah. it right here. You know, some people say, I got it, but they but they meant they started a journey to get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's what he says in beginning with chapter three and chapter one of Second Peter, he says, For this very reason make every effort to add your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control, mm-hmm. and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. And here comes a qualifier. Mm-hmm. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And here it comes. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Hmm. Then he goes on to say, and this, this really hit me when I first studied this passage, therefore, because of what he just said before, my brothers and sisters, make every effort, this is work, to confirm your calling And election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Mm -hmm. Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, and here comes the kicker. And I had it in my message. Remember, remember, remember. He says, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now Mm. have. Then he says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body, meaning this body. He's going to leave it because I know that that I will soon put it aside. And then he says it a third time. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So we have to be in a, a state of being reminded, reminding others and allowing others to remind us constantly. Yeah. And what do we have to remind ourselves about? Mm -hmm. Grace will lose its value if I forget that I sin. Right. And when people people have talked to me many times about it, and I've been in this place, you kind of forget sin and go, well, I don't want to focus on that. We're basically all good and on and on and on. Yeah. Well, how potent would grace be if you really don't think you need it? Right. Then it just it just withers away. So Peter's saying, you gotta know you're a sinner. Yeah. Not with a morbid introspection, like a negative focus. Yeah. But this honest admission that, yeah, I'm sinning today, and thank you. Go right to thank you, Lord, for your grace. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know those are core concepts to 12 step recovery? Oh, really? That's interesting. Step four, <laughs> I conducted a ser- uh, yeah. searching and fearless moral inventory of myself and then admitted my mistakes. A person in recovery will do that constantly. Right. They'll say, "How's your inventory? Taking your inventory." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can be, it can seem like a negative, but it's only negative if that's all you do. Right. I'm a sinner, and I am, and so I'm done talking about it. That's negative. That leaves yeah. like, oh. But knowing my sin should push me to grace. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I didn't do anything to get. Yeah. And I can't possibly lose. And that overwhelms it. That's why Paul says, where sin is, grace abounds. Right, right. He's saying, if you're in a covenant, you can acknowledge your sin. You could admit it. Why? Because it doesn't undo you. Yeah. You're still solid and healthy. Yeah. Because grace has covered it. That's how I see that. Yeah. Is that, is that, because you also mentioned in your, in your sermon that like suffering can be uh, beneficial. And I think especially, I think you said, especially for Christians. Yes. Um, is that is that connected in any way, or it is? So that so many times in the Bible it says, uh, "Take take joy in your suffering, rejoice in suffering." All of this, it's yeah. like, what what's this crazy theme? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, the message: if we're not a Christian yet, or a nominal Christian, whatever, we may or may not get any benefit from suffering. Mm-hmm. But if I'm a Christian and I read these verses, that 
that leads me to want to investigate. How, how could that work? What do you mean? Yeah. And so I did mention the message that it really points to Romans 8, 20, uh, 28 and 29. Yeah. I'm, it helped me become more like Jesus. But you know what? Even Viktor Frankl, and I mentioned him in the message, the psychotherapist who was in the prison camp in Auschwitz. Right, right, right. He's not a Christian. He saw the same possibility because we're a Mago Day. We're designed a certain way mm. that if we can choose to see light and suffering, we can choose to see there's got to be good coming out of this and stay on that focus. Yeah. That's when we can be strengthened and grow in character. Right. And Christ just makes it the best it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. Admitting that we're sinners at birth is really hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. I have a friend that I've done triathlon training with, a group of us. Yeah. And often when you're riding, you ride next to somebody you haven't talked to in a while. And you say, all right, let's you and I chat. Yeah. And when you're done, you ride someone else. Yeah. And you all just check in. Hey, Bob. Hey, Susie, how you doing? Yeah. And the group rides, but you chat. Yeah. You check in. There's one individual, a really fine person, Buddhist, mm -hmm. checked in. And as we went along, they know I'm a pastor at Shoreline. Right. So she had some questions. She said, well, you know, all people are basically born good anyway. I said, well, that's intriguing. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Well, we're all basically good. And then, you know, I said, you know what? She goes, well, things happen. I said, what things happen? Because there's a lot of people doing not good things. Yeah. How does that come about? And she kind of teed it up for me. Yeah. She said, well, you know, your parents, when you're growing up, make mistakes and screw things up and you're impacted by, yeah. you know, nurture, nature, all of that. And I said, yeah, but how did those parents yeah. get to the point where they screwed up? Well, their parents. I said, but what about their parents? And so she goes, I'm not doing this. Because <laughs> what I was doing saying, you know what you want to trace? We'll go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And so here's the reality as a sociologist might be able to tell you, or an anthropologist. Yeah. If mankind was born basically good, doesn't it make sense there should be some lost tribe yeah. somewhere who's been recently discovered somewhere on the planet? And in that tribe... They've maintained the goodness, or right up until you discovered them and started messing them up, they were all good and recorded it. It's on a cave wall. It's written down on something. You could you could retrieve it. You yeah. could look at it. There's never been a discovery of anything mm -hmm. like that in all the world in cultural anthropology. Mm -hmm. But you know what there has been? Plenty of recording, depictions of, artwork about what man does to man. Mm -hmm. All the way back as far as the earliest cave dwelling, there are people harming each other. Yeah. To the earliest empires, the Akkadian empires and the Sumerians, what they did to each other. So that's not a negative. It's like, I'm sorry to say, that's who we are. Yeah. And so the Lord says, and I don't want you to stay that way. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live in that. Yeah. I wouldn't want to. No. Yeah. No, it's, it, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I think, I wonder if, uh, you know, I, I wonder how that's received is uh, from, you know, someone you said she was Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, yeah, I think that's, it's an interesting, cause there's a different, you know, perspective on life in general when you're coming from a different religion. I, it's, it's interesting to bring it back to, you know, the cultural anthropology uh, realities that we all live in and, and can understand and accept. It's, that's challenging. I, I, I did want to ask you too, um, uh, you know, when you're talking about in your sermon, um, about you know suffering and how it can be uh, a beneficial thing for Christians, um, I feel like sometimes uh, it can feel like it's not a uh, a period of of your character being challenged and growing. And yeah. but how how can we recognize and understand like you know in that moment like man I think this might be an ordained situation where where I'm I'm being grown and I'm being challenged and, you know, I'm in, I'm in that moment of crushing, uh, and, and I'm going to come out on the other side with a new perspective and, yeah. and I can grow from that. Well, I've had a way I've looked at it for yeah. years and I'll put it out there and see what folks think. But on occasion, someone will ask me either as a counselor or more so as a pastor, mm -hmm. why is this happening to me? Is it something I've done? Is it Satan? Is it, and when I'm done listening, I'll say, you know, I honestly don't know. Because there's four ways things happen. There's Satan, there's the world, there's my own heart. And then in Ecclesiastes, it says, paraphrasing, 
the battle doesn't always go to the strongest nor the race to right. the swiftest, but chance can occur to us all. Maybe it's chance. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I can't give you the answer, but here's what I can tell you. If you want to, you can find God mm -hmm. in the midst of your struggle because that he promises. So can I encourage you to look for him Yeah. even until you get an answer on why it's happening? Right. Because sometimes when you look for an answer, what if it's an answer you don't like? Yeah. And makes you feel angry at God? Yeah. I just tell folks, well, while you're trying to find out what the real reason is, let's just go forward. And then the next thing is, please don't do it alone. Right. Have someone that you trust who knows the Lord alongside of you who can listen mm -hmm. and walk with you. Not try to fix everything, but just hear you yeah. and care for you and be compassionate with you because Scripture tells us that that person is delivering the presence of Christ. Yeah. So that's an advantage we have as believers. Community and fellowship is at a super high premium mm -hmm. for many reasons, Yeah. especially going through a difficult time. Now, another point of view is this. I had a, a woman that I counseled many, many years ago tell me repeatedly because she'd had these horrible things happen in her life. Yeah. Why did God do this? And why did, or why did God allow it? Right. I said, I don't really know, but can I ask you some questions? I know up until a couple of years ago, you and your husband were leaders in your church, mm -hmm. right? And, and you prayed with people. Yeah. Things were going okay for you then, right? Yeah, pretty fair. What did you tell the people who came to you about their suffering? Right about why did God allow it or whatever, what did you do? She said, well, we just prayed for him. Did you encourage him? Yes, we did. But it's not happening for you now. Mm -hmm. No. So you see, that's part of our human nature too. We're magnanimous, generous with our prayers and thoughts and all that for others who are struggling. But when we struggle, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, not me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I can be a comforting and a caring believer when others are going through it. But when I'm going through it, there's almost this thing of, it shouldn't really be happening to me. Yeah. And so, you know what I tell myself, Cole? I think, why would I think it wouldn't? Yeah. My son would call me from college. He was at San Diego State. I used to call it Sodom and Gomorrah Tech. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got to tell you, the insane things that would go on at that yeah. school. It's probably all changed now. Oh, absolutely. In case anyone yeah. from the administration is listening. Yeah. And he'd say, I'd say, Connor, what are you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm fine. Well, tell me. He goes, I said, tell me. Come on. He goes, oh, really? You really want to know? He wasn't walking with the Lord at the time. He yeah. said, well, I look out our window, and there's two guys fighting outside our window. And we woke up, and down the hall, they had a big party, and there's people sleeping in the hall. We don't know who they are. Yeah. And I haven't eaten in four days. I know what he was spending his money on. Yeah. But we found out how to get in this other girl's dormitory room. and had a big birthday party, so we're eating on her cake when she leaves for class. <laughs> And I said, wow, God, you're like barely surviving. And then he said, Pop, why do you think all this is happening to me? <laughs> and I said, Con, what do you think? What's the question? He goes, oh, I hate this. Why did I think it wouldn't? That's the question. Yeah. Where did where did we come from? The irony is he's both an MFT therapist now and a pastor. Yeah. But the idea was, where did we get the notion that these things shouldn't yeah. Happen. Yeah. A cursory look at history shows that they've always happened. Yeah. And always will, as Viktor Frankl wrote. Yeah. So I need to get my mind around that to really fully understand what God's done for me through Jesus. Right. Otherwise, the struggle can take over, begin to feel out of balance, unfair, too repetitious, yeah. too many. I can't lose sight of him or I can I can be swallowed up by that kind of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Well, how do you, you know, I, I think you also mentioned in your message that there's like this, uh, you know, the idea of that sin is kind of in our DNA be, because of the things that Adam had done in Genesis. And so, you know, I think it's really easy for us to be like, well, you know, the goodness of God, the, the you know, his great love for us, his plan for us. And yet we've been, we've been forced into this like bad hand, you know, we've been given this, this bad hand and, you know, uh, how do we reconcile that with, you know, that, that... Well, we've been given a bad hand, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. Okay. Cain and Abel. Yeah. What do we remember most about Cain and Abel? That one killed the other. Cain murdered Abel. Yeah. Why? Why would he do that? Dysfunctional parenting. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, Adam and Eve were broken. Yeah. They were broken. They could not have parented their kids perfectly. Yeah. It's impossible. So how did Abel go on and parent perfectly? He couldn't. Right. And so there's not only in our DNA, but it's handed down from original parents. Right. So there isn't parents on the planet now who could ever say, nor would they. We've somehow achieved perfect parenting. It's both born in our DNA, thank you, Adam, Yeah. but also who among us can't cite, even with parents they adore, mistakes their parents made along the way. Right. And when you make them young, in other words, the children are young, you're warm, wet clay, you're impressionable. Yeah. Those mistakes go in and they have some impact, hopefully mi minimal. Yeah, right. But for others, there's more. So that's Deuteronomy in some ways saying the sins of the fathers and the right. grandfathers are handed down. Yeah. The stuff, part of our legacy is with our kids is beautiful things and broken things. Yeah. No one escapes that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of really uh, powerful uh, realities throughout this whole thing. I think, uh, you know, we're born with, you know, this challenging thing called sin. And, and I think there's a, I, I've been hearing that there's a, there's a way to say I can grow from that and I can learn from that through Christ and, and what he's done for us and to receive that grace. That's a, that's a powerful thing. And another thing that is, I am, it's ringing true through this whole discussion. And it's, it's that we need to be open with someone that we trust and yes. we need to have that person in our life and we need to have that community. And I know it's, seems like it's difficult um, now. And I feel like it's, it sometimes feels like it's being stripped from us. But uh, yeah. I, I, I think that there's ways that we can figure out how to have those people in our lives sure. and, and have to have that, that person that you can trust and love and care. And so, Hey Dennis, I, I really appreciate this discussion. It's, it's opened up a ton of conversation, uh, points for me and questions and, and, uh, you know, I hope we can maybe even get you back on sometime and, and talk more about these things, but I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, you know, answer these questions and have this discussion. Yeah. I think it's going to be very helpful for a can lot I of people. Can I connect two more dots? I would love that. Okay. When I counsel, what am I giving people that's so helpful? Yeah. If you looked at a pie chart of why counseling is helpful, when it is, yeah, it's like this big chart and there's 12 slices, technique, timing, place, location, yeah. all of this. The single biggest slice is 40% of the pie. That's the relationship. Mm -hmm. You could be the most skilled technician in counseling in the world. If the relationship isn't built, the counseling is unlikely to be mm -hmm. effective. So say the re relationship is built. What does a counselor offer that person? Right. Confidentiality safety, good listening, you know, affirmation. Mm -hmm. People can do that without counseling. Yeah. And why is it so powerful and effective? I really believe this all my heart. It's what my father does with me. He hears me. He accepts me just as I am. As Pastor Kevin referenced yeah. the George Beverly Shea song at yeah. the Billy Graham Crusades, yeah. just as I am. I know that in my heart. And sometimes I wake up in the morning and I giggle. I do, that you let me do ministry today, me. <gasps> and you still let me do this. What a lucky dog. Yeah. Because he knows me and accepts me and loves me just as I am, only because of grace. Mm -hmm. That proved it to me. So I want to encourage everyone to consider yeah. that. We can all offer each other the essential elements of counseling mm -hmm. because they're based on what he does with us. That's why they work in us. That's why they'll work in others. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. I think uh, that's something that a lot of people need to hear right now and uh, need to hear that they can have, you know, relationships with people that can be uh, just a form of relief and, and uh, can help them guide them towards, you know, their the relationship with Christ that can offer that kind of peace, that yes. kind of of hope. So I, again, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for, for doing this, for being a part of this. It's such a, a blessing. Blast. Yeah, it's been fun. So yeah. I hope to do it again soon, but thank you again. Okay. Thank you too, Cole. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week with another one.